There you go. Thanks, Louis. Welcome everyone on planet Earth. This is the Conundrum Press segment of the Expo Zine. If you're in Montreal, yay, everybody. My name's Andy Brown. I am the publisher at Conundrum Press. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of Expo Zine and wish I could be there with everyone at a table in a big smelly gym, a church basement with lots of sweat and books and awesome stuff. But we are here Zooming. So we have some amazing artists here, authors, writers, cartoonists, uh, who are going to present their books. These are books that um, came out in, some of them came out in the spring. And, you know, we're going to be launched at TCAF in May. Didn't really happen because no TCAF for obvious reasons. So they've been doing some digital stuff. And then we have Dakota McFadden who is just launching his new book, um, which, you know what, I'll just hold up books as well, to know you're alive. So that's awesome. So he's going to be our, uh, our, our, our uh, you know, lead, the, the hitter that goes forth, basically. So the home run hitter. Um, so we're gonna do, we're gonna go in order of people that the the publishing order. So Howard actually Howard Chagowitz, who uh, did this amazing book uh, Nothing to See Here, launched. Uh, were you at Exposing last year, Howard? You were right. Yeah, you had a launch. The book the launch for Nothing to See Here wasn't until like end of December 2019. Okay, so we just missed Exposing. So here you are. This is your Exposing debut. So yeah. I'm gonna let Howard talk about his book, and everyone's gonna talk for about ten minutes. And feel free. I'll be asking questions and Howard, do you want me to ask you some questions or are you just gonna wing it? I know you're able to wing things. Oh, I, I see, because I wasn't sure how this was gonna be. So what I All actually right. did was, <laughs> I actually set some stuff up. I was gonna put some music. Do it. I brought, I brought funny hats. Do it. Should we just do that? <laughs> sure. Right. So, but you know what? How about if I talk for like uh, three minutes sure. and, then, and then you can ask me questions. Is that possible? Can you only talk, is that, can you hold yourself for three minutes? Let's do it. Three okay. minutes, go. I'll just show a few things. Here we go. Thank you, everybody. So, so nice to be here with everybody. And of course, I'll start with the hats. I'm, I'm going to put a little music on also. <laughs> this is a, I try to, try to revolutionize Zoom meetings. <laughs> okay, three minutes are up, Howard. All right. So, next. That would be so appropriate. Three minutes of me just trying to figure this out. Why is this not working? Oh, right, here we go. All right, so nothing to see here was the book that came out in 2019 at the very end. So I almost didn't get a chance to really launch it, but luckily I did, I, like not the new year. So here's the book and I'll show you a few, the idea, actually I did, I, I thought I had a good quote that I wrote on the, on the Exposine page, but anyway, I forget, it doesn't matter. Here we go. So basically just the unconventional gag cartoons uh, meant to talk about uh, human suffering and cruelty and all that, often very offensive. I'll show you a few. This is not how I had it planned. Wear, you wear many hats. There you go. This is all from the book. That's right, that was the back cover. There you go. I don't know, so this is failing. Maybe I should take questions. <laughs> sure. So Howard, yes, I'm gonna sir. ask you, so this is a book of gags, right? Can you define what a gag cartoon is? What's the difference between a gag and a comic? And a drawing. Well, I, I, I think we all, for all of us here, yeah, so com we can start an argument with this about what comics are and what cartoons are. But yeah, I guess gag cartoons, mine are, are meant to make you gag. Uh, I guess <laughs> the idea is, you know, a uh, 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 funny joke or an ironic little uh, illustration to, uh, to uh, I don't know, what's a gag cartoon? Oh, man. Yeah, I'm really sorry. Oh, really okay, funny. so gag, okay, you want me to answer the question, question for you? What's so a gag, a gag would be written and drawn, and you cannot separate the writing and the drawing. It isn't like there's, so, so its meaning comes from both at the same time, right? Whether it's funny or not, whereas a comic has, could be a picture and text, right? I guess, well, for me, the way I always thought, thought was, uh, you know, a, a comic is two or more uh, illustrations in a sequence or photos or whatever, to communicate a story or idea, and a and a gag cartoon or cartoon is just one single solitary image there. I guess that and to tell a joke or same thing. But just if it stands alone in my mind, it's a cartoon, especially if it's drawn a certain way. And if it's and if it's two or more, I say that's comic. Do, do we all agree with that? Or is it like, 
Did anyone ever catch that huge? Oh, this is crazy. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. There was a huge debate between Colin Upton and all these people. Uh, a huge argument about wh about what the difference between a gag cartoon and a cartoon was, and a comic, and all this stuff. And then it's got into web co comics, whether that was real and all. Anyway, so this maybe we shouldn't go into such controversial. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'll show. What, what should I do? What should I do? More hats. I'll tell you what. We can. We can. <laughs> You can just keep putting the hats on. Okay, Why don't we move along on. and to and then we'll come back to you, Howard. All right, sounds good. How does that sound? But that keep keep adding more hats. I'll keep doing like that. Put hat. another hat on top of that hat and then keep going. Let, let me let me do we'll see one how one many little, hats you can get on. Let me do one little promo before before we move on. Nothing to see here. A book Done. of gag cartoons by Howard Chakwith, published by Conundrum Press. Many are filthy. Many are disturbing. They are all meant to haunt you. Thank you. I'm done. I'll just do it with the hats. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Howard. And by the way, I should point out all of these books are available conundrumpress.com. All, uh, all available off the website. Uh, your order will come to me. I'll hand deliver it with a special treat, free shipping. Um, so, but there's no excuse, Christmas presents. Okay, so <laughs> we're gonna move on to, to, uh, to Catherine Oslot for her book, Art Life which came out, I believe, in April of, uh, of this year, I guess. Another person who was not able to launch a TCAP, unfortunately. The book is a translation of La Vie d'Artiste, um, translated by Alicia Jensen, um, lovingly translated. And uh, so she's going to talk. She, you're in Montreal, Catherine. Do you want to do you have a talk? You, know, I, you don't need any hats. Just talk. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't have hats. No, OK. I'm afraid I'm going to be less colorful than uh, Howard. But well, uh, nobody's as colorful as Howard. So. I, failed, I failed for all of you to advance, so now it's smooth sailing for the rest of you. That's right. We set you up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yes. So it's, um, it's a book about, uh, it's um, uh, autofiction. So it's a book about, um, um, it, I'm sorry, uh, obviously I'm francophone, so it always takes me a few minutes before I get into the uh, uh, English. Uh, it's a book in which I, I went to interview many artists, friends about their art life. So I wanted to investigate various, arts, uh, various aspects of uh, what it means to have, um, to be an artist and to have, um, what it means to be in this uh, in this art life. So uh, I I try to uh, explore the idea of maybe success and uh, uh, inspiration and what it means to have a family in, in the middle of all of that and um, what inspires us and uh, all the difficulties that might be inherent to uh, to the art life. So. So everybody's a little bit like, but half human, all the characters are half human and half bird. I don't know if you can see. Oh yeah. And so, um, and so yes, like I mix, it's really a mix of interviews and of my, uh, my own, uh, my own life, like everyday life. So it's, you see my daughter, you see uh, my family, you see me like, watching uh, a movie and stuff like that so yes okay great how did you choose the people to interview um i went a little bit well with the people i knew or people i was uh, curious about i i didn't interview except for julie delport i didn't interview anybody that were that were doing comics I wanted to I I, um, I wanted to explore yeah. like other uh, forms of art also to see what the difference might be or I was curious for example like what does it mean to be a director uh, like making a movie is such a huge like enterprise so I wanted to see uh, uh, say how how do you feel about making a movie? How do you feel when you're friends with that super successful uh, director and your movies are not as successful? Like, how do you feel with the competition, uh, jealousy and stuff like that? Um, um, I, 
there's a, um, there's a woman that is an artist, uh, that is a, um, not a um, in French we say a comedian, but in English it's a, she's an actress. She's an actress and also a director of movies. So I wanted to, I wanted to know like when it me what it means when you're a woman and when you're maybe over 70 or 80 years old, like uh, how is your career? Like, how do you feel having lived all of that life of like often struggles? Like, how do you continue? Where do you find the energy to keep on going? And um, so I chose, like I went a little bit with uh, my instinct and my curiosity. And, and I guess uh, I went to, so I, I was looking for, I guess, uh, for um, maybe qualities that I wanted to uh, inherit from these people. Yeah. In how, the did book. You, how did you find the, um, I mean, this, this came out in French and it actually won, won a nice big award. What was the award it won in French? It was the Bédélis Award. Yeah, so which is, which is fantastic. How did you, so it got translated by Alicia Jensen and then it came out in English, and obviously the <laughs> the launch of it in English was not quite the same as the launch of it in French. Uh, but how did you find that process going? Because you did all the lettering too, yeah. so you know you you were very intimately involved in taking it from a French edition into an English edition. Yeah. And how how did you find that process? I mean, is this your first translation? It is my first translation. Yeah, it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really love the process. Well, working with Alicia is just really fun. She's awesome. Yes, and um, and um, I know I don't sound funny or come like, um, less than uh, Howard, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's there's some jokes in the books. No, no, it's <laughs> and it's not There's some parts of it that I found so funny, like much funnier in English. Like the oh, okay. I wrote them, like they were making me laugh um, a lot. Uh, the part where I'm I'm trying to understand like Christopher Nolan's movie, and I'm I'm wondering why why they argue about the theory of relativity, and I I cannot follow anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tune out for for two minutes of the movie without being lost. Like that that part in the in the book, I found like I don't know, like it, it, it's it's a different book. Okay, uh, you find it really different. But for me, it's different. Yeah, for you. Of okay. course, like there's some stuff, like maybe play of words that were not possible to put, but there's, okay. there's other stuff that Alicia added that I really found. Okay, interesting. Really so the role of the translator was was very, there was a lot, lot of it. Yeah, okay, cool. So. Okay, well, why don't we uh, move along in this conundrum cabaret and we'll come back to everybody. Thank you so much. Catherine, uh, again, the book, Art Life, the English translation of uh, La Vie d'Artiste. And okay, so next we have uh, Veronica, Veronica Post. Hi. Here, all the way from uh, the Atlantic bubble, which is where <laughs> I'm also, we're in the same bubble. She's in Halifax. And uh, her book is called Fugitive Days, or Langosh and Pepe, I should say, Fugitive Days. So the the first part, well, you've got it too. The first part of uh, what I understand to be a series, but this is Veronica's first uh, graphic novel and she pretty much knocked it out of the park. So I will uh, let her talk about it. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, so my my book is also uh, an auto fiction. I like that phrase, Catherine. Autobiographical fiction. So. All of the events that happen in the book are things that happen to me, but the characters are fictional. So obviously I'm, I'm not this man, but uh, I created these characters in order to help me sort of tell, tell the story without feeling too self-conscious. Uh, and it's basically about the travels of Langosh and Pepe, Pepe through Central and Eastern Europe, kind of, uh, trying to remain a little bit uh, on the low, down low. They're hiding a little bit and they're sort of, uh, yeah, living a bit of an unconventional life. So they encounter a lot of interesting stuff on their way. And the, the last part of the book is about my experience um, witnessing the migrant crisis that was happening in Europe in 2015. 
uh, with all of the refugees from the Middle East, uh, especially Syria arriving there. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what it's about. And hopefully there will be more because there's many more adventures yet to come in other locations of the world, probably North America next. Okay, yeah. now you, you, <laughs> the process, so this is your first graphic novel. Yeah. And I worked on you with this, although not all that much. Um, I like to feel that I that I helped a little bit. You but did you help. Redrawing the whole book. Can you tell yeah. people why you wrote <laughs> the book in like one month just before? Yeah. They, before so I had to send it to print. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell you about that, Andy. As I was. No, you didn't that. until later. <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna tell Andy that I'm redrawing the entire thing. Yes. <laughs> well. I think probably largely it was because, yeah, it's my first book, so I'm, I'm not experienced in these things. And I didn't take the time, I didn't really want to uh, sit down and like write out the entire story before I started drawing. So I was just drawing and going down these paths and then ended up realizing, I don't really think that part should go in there. So it was like a lot of, uh, a lot of exploration and drawing before I finally had the the actual book that I wanted. And then when I went back and looked at it, the earlier drawings did not look like the later drawings. So I felt like it, to make it harmonious, I needed to go back and redraw like almost the entire book um, to make it all look like I wanted it to look like. So that was a learning experience. <laughs> How did you do that? So How did me, I do it? It seemed as if you had two different pens. There was like a line issue. Yeah. Uh, so did you put it every page on a light board and just redraw everything? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did. And it was I was actually using the same pen, but my the the pressure that I put on the pen was different because I used fountain pens and nibs. Okay. And um, I was like really more like when I first started out, I was more into like thicker lines. And then as I started drawing, I I discovered that I actually preferred the look of the thinner lines and like a little bit more of a lighter look. So, so yeah, I, I kind of actually developed my style while working on this book and I didn't really have a style previous to that. So I developed my, this was my uh, development of, of cartoon style. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you would be in Montreal right now with the rest of us. So you lived in Montreal for a while? You, you Yeah, I, I lived in Montreal for a long time. I lived in Montreal from 2006 to 2014. Oh, wow. Um, on and off. I also went to Hungary a few times in that in those years, but I was there a lot. And I, I went to I went to Rosemount Technical Center to do a cabinet making program. And that was right. awesome. And then I was working in cabinet making factories there yeah. Yeah. yeah so it was good that was good i was in lots of punk bands and making zines and doing all that stuff in montreal can you, like can you name a punk band you're in howard chakowitz might know <laughs> i don't know if howard would know it or not but what did uh, you play what well, i played drums oh my goodness <laughs> howard. like you howard i Let's know have a zoom drumming session later That's howard me. we need to start a two drum set band wow. and we can name like because howard already wants to start a band with me called the big slobs so it's it's in the works the big slobs the big slobs yeah that's our band name <laughs> i was in a band called the pantyhose pantyhose i was in the band <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, no, Montreal was great. I had a really good time there. I was like my first place that I lived uh, other than Halifax, like my first place out of Halifax that I lived in my like young adult life. And it was great. It was like bohemian and awesome. So yeah, I definitely, I, I grew a lot as an artist in Montreal for sure. Yeah. Always loved going to Exposine. And you said you did yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, you've been to Exposine. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I even tabled at Exposine. My own zines. Did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was in a little zine distro there. We had a zine distro called Walking Distance Distro, okay. and we did little things in in Montreal. And we had uh, we had a table at Exposine for years. So, uh, yeah, it was good. Good times. Great. Yeah. You're an old hand. Yeah. Um. Well, we're going to move along and we'll come back. I mean, we're going to have time to come back and everyone can talk over each other later and we'll put all of you off of mute, except Howard will be on mute. 
So we're going to move along to Dakota. Uh, if you're ready, Dakota, I am. you look, look like you were born ready over there. Um, so Dakota is in Toronto. Uh, so we're, we're pan global here. Um, he has just launched, just to know you're alive, just came out in uh, October, like literally a month or so ago. And he's done a, 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 a digital event at uh, the Beguiling in Toronto. Amazing store and hope everyone knows about it um and so this is a book i'm gonna let him talk about it but this is a book that um came about it's a book of short stories and they were all pieced together from work that dakota had self-published um and then we he put them all together and then he colored so it's a two color so the, the artwork is just unbelievably stunning uh, it's all in one pink Pantone, which just makes it awesome. Um, so he he's going to talk from Toronto about his book. So Dakota, why don't you talk? Hi. Um, yeah, so as Andy said, the book uh, is a collection of short comics that I did, uh, primarily self-published as mini comics, which is was sort of the main thing I did over the last 10 years. Uh, so this this book collects seven years worth of work and Somewhere about at the halfway point of that seven year mark, uh, my wife and I had a kid and then another kid. And so my stories always sort of gravitate towards like horror and nightmares and existential dread and that kind of thing. But they were often sort of set in a, in a childhood setting, like they were very nostalgic featuring child characters, not stories for children, but about children and from a child's point of view, uh, that sort of idea of looking for something or learning something for the first time or uh, thinking that the world works in some magical way and finding out that it doesn't and that it's actually much more grounded and unmagical than that. And what I noticed when Andy and I started sort of looking at stories that I had to put into the book is that after I had kids, the stories became a lot more outward looking and the fear was less focused on like inner nightmares and inner fears and more became about like the horrors of the world at large. Um, I imagine because you know I was suddenly holding this, these cute little wriggling babies and being like, Jesus Christ, I got to protect them from <laughs> everything in the world. Uh, so that's that's sort of a fundamental change in point of view that that I think is is legible in the book. Um, and we even put in an intermission, which is something I always wanted to do in a book where we threw in a few hodgepodge strips and stories that didn't fit anywhere else. I always thought the idea of having an intermission in a book was very funny. So thank you for letting me do that, Andy. Uh, yeah, and, and that's that's the book. It's it's thematically coherent, but the story is very wildly in content and visual style. Okay, great. Uh, so what questions do I have for you? So, so you're working on a graphic novel, like a larger work, Marie Geisner, mm -hmm. um, which will be coming one day. We know that that's a lot of work. <laughs> and so part of the reason we put this book together was uh, obviously anyone who's had toddlers knows the amount of work that that takes and it's very hard to make a graphic novel. Uh, so we, so when I approached Dakota and you know, he was feeling frustrated um, about this process. And I said, well, look, you, you've made all these amazing shorts, right? Like, and I've, I've been collecting his short mini comics and stuff. So let's put those together and he's like, oh, okay. So that, that's sort of how this all started out. So I wanted to ask you the process, um, the difference, I guess, between a short story in comic form of which there is no name and a graphic novel, which is a longer piece, which operates in a different narrative arc, is obviously written differently. How do you find that experience? I mean, it, it can vary from project to project, I think maybe I allow myself a little bit more freedom with the short stories to kind of wing it. I mean, my impulse is to wing it regardless, because if I have to write and draw the whole thing roughly and then write and draw it again, I, I get too bored by the end of it. So I sort of have to leave an aspect of improvisation to the process. Um, but, you know, with some of the short stories in this collection, I just kind of started on the first page and tried to see where it went without any real idea of what the ending was going to be. And for some of the other ones, like I really like beat them out, you know, in bullet point form first and, and really planned it from the beginning. Um, I think the biggest difference is just the stamina required for a graphic novel. Like it takes so long that 
through the process of working on it, you become a different person and you don't <laughs> necessarily even believe in the stuff that you wrote in the first bit of the book. So I'm finding that, you know, I'm finding that really hard right now because uh, in the graphic novel, it's about an aging paranormal investigator. You know, he's never really found any solid proof of ghosts or the paranormal and he's getting a little more desperate to find that near the end of his life. Yeah, but, you know, ghost hunting doesn't pay well. So he works in a grocery store and tries to make ends meet. And like now with COVID and everything, it feels like there's an opportunity to like explore a whole other dimension of that story. I don't know how much I want to go back in and update it for post 2020 life, but that's an example of like, you know, myself changing as well as the world at large changing in the middle of the process. So I'm finding that to be maybe the most difficult part of working on a longer project is just the stamina required to see it through. Yeah, well, fair enough. And, and you bring up a good point there, because I'm finding this because I'm obviously working with uh, with a lot of different artists for books that are coming out next year and the year after and you guys and everything. And so, yeah, there's a whole year here of COVID. So if you're doing anything autobiographical, it kind of needs to be addressed. So like right. Sammy Awani, I'm publishing a book. He's doing all these uh, cartoons on his Instagram that are all about him you know, managing COVID and he had COVID and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, people are addressing it. And, you know, my, uh, my wife's a novelist, Christiane Conlon, and she's writing a book that's in the present day, quote unquote, but she started it like two years ago. So the present day when the book comes out is totally different. Like, do you address the fact that all these people died? You know, like it's in a nursing home. So right. that's kind of an interesting place to set a novel after COVID. So, what do you do about that? Like, do you just not mention it? Do you, do you, you know, do you have a, 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 you know, a nod to it and say, that's not what my book's about. So I'm going to go elsewhere. Um, anyway, so yes, I see, I see exactly your point, especially with the graphic novel that takes five, seven years to do. And, yeah. and, you know, you might be drawn. The other thing you talked about is having, having the children, you know, when you start, let's say you're doing something more autobiographical. Well, you start out, well, I know Dave Collier, for example, does this. You start out and the kid is 12 and, you know, up to here. Mm -hmm. And then when you finish the novel, the kid's taller than you in university. So at what, how do you draw this child, right? And and because they change so fast, right? So, totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How are you finding the parenting and, and artisting? I mean, it's it's always a challenge, especially at, present because I was I was doing storyboard work for most of this year of course, yeah and then the the sort of big contract I was working on ended right around the time my wife was finishing her mat leave and going back to work so I'm the full-time parent now I mean we're all in the house together but like my wife's at work so I I try to make it to the studio a couple of evenings a week but the mistake I made with my first child was thinking well, I'll just power through. I'll just be as productive as I ever was and be a little more tired and, you know, I'll keep that fire going. And all that did was make me miserable and make me a worse parent. So uh, yes. less, less patient and less energy and, you know, it just sucked. So this time with the second kid, uh, I'm trying to be, a, I'm trying to view it as more of a, a bit of a sabbatical from cartooning and accept that you right. know, if I make it to the studio a couple of times a week, that's at least keeping the pot of water warm if not boiling so yeah not to put, yeah not to expect yeah. back too much right and like you said they do grow so fast so like now in, both intellectually and emotionally i understand that this time is extremely finite you know in the middle of it with my first child it felt like i'm gonna get screamed at by this tiny person forever and you know thankfully that is not the case they they change and grow and it's beautiful and teeth come in. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> they're mostly fine yeah just the teeth just the teeth if it's just that's the only problem <laughs> yes okay i'm gonna so we have we got like 20 minutes left so i'm gonna open it up to everybody to ask everybody questions but for uh oh back coda's book to know your life uh conundrumpress.com out now every bookstore on the planet has a copy you should buy it because it's awesome um, so something that Dakota said, Catherine, I want to ask you about that because I am about uh, parenting and your, your graphic novel deals a lot with the fact that your art life has to incorporate your child, right? Because you have a child, they're a part of your life. And uh, many art, I mean, I get these conversations all the time. Many artists don't have children because 
they want an art life and they know that it's very complicated. Um, so how, uh, and you represent your daughter in your comic and she becomes a very important character. Um, and I guess I, I'm not really sure what my question is other than can you comment on, you know, parenting in an art life, which your book does, that's part of your book, but. It's funny because when I started to make the book, I, um, my intention uh, was to not talk about children and not talk about uh, relationships. Um, I, I mean, uh, love relationships because like, as a woman, we're always asked these questions and I thought, no, I just want to talk about the art life. But then so quickly I realized that it's impossible not to talk about, <laughs> about it because it's such a huge, um, uh, having children takes such a huge amount of space in your life. So that's why my, my daughter is a, a little bit everywhere in, in, in my life. Like, but to me, I found, um, and I talk a little bit about it in the book, um, um, I'm separated from the father of my daughter. And so to me, to be able to um, concentrate on my work and be there for my daughter, I, I sort of dis like decided like that I, I didn't want to pursue uh, a, relationships like for a moment you know so I decided you know what like I have my friends I have my family I have my daughter like I have my work this is this is fine for now and we'll see later but right now my, my plate is full so for me that was how I found uh, an equilibrium because otherwise like that there, there's some stuff you have to sacrifice, and uh, I, I agree when uh, with what Dakota said. Like you, you cannot have the expectation of having everything and managing everything, and it's impossible. You, you have to let go of stuff. So maybe your book that is going to take you two years to make, like normally, it will take you four years, but uh, you will have less pressure on yourself and. It's, you're just going to be happier because otherwise you, you're just miserable. It's really frustrating. So, uh, and, and, and they, they do grow fast, but they, they, they it's really, <laughs> come, they become independent like say, quite fast. It doesn't feel like it when they're four year old, but, but, uh, but they become 12 pretty, pretty fast. And, and, but, so, I think I forgot. No, it's okay. Did you did you find like what I was saying to Dakota, where you start a book and you're drawing your child, and then you finish a book and the child has grown, but yeah. you know, but you want to make the book consistent because it only takes whatever 10, yeah. 15, 20 minutes to read. Did you find that as an issue? Like you kept drawing her younger than she was? Yeah, or, yeah you found that. that? Too. Yes, in yeah. that book and, and uh, the, the work that I'm doing right now is the same thing. Like yeah. I started my, my work right now a year ago and I was drawing her yesterday and okay. I was like, oh, please, she yeah, doesn't yeah. dress like that anymore. Yeah. No, she's almost as tall as I am and she doesn't talk like that anymore. So you have to make, a, I have to fix her and and an age and say hey right. go back to be like veronica to, yeah you could be like veronica and redraw your whole book but just the child yeah. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone have any questions for any of the other artists i'm sure howard does so like less me talking and more you guys talking or do you want me to throw out a question to everybody no i have a question you think i have a question for everybody Okay, uh, so, what, what does everyone uh, think of Conundrum Press? No, I'm not joking. Um, so you've all, have you all made, you've all, I think all of you have made uh, like self-published minis. And I've obviously published, you know, your, your full length books with spines and everything. How do you find, uh, what is the difference? So Veronica, you talk, well, Howard, you're on right now. Why don't you talk about that? You, you've made some mini comics and things. How do you find, what's the difference? Between having like a mini or- I mean, And even having a published book in a bookstore and- Well, it's funny actually, the, the, the first book, I don't know if it was the first comic you ever published, but wasn't my Howie Action Comics with, with that, that, yes. 
So that has an ISBN number and everything, but there's no spine. So it's not really considered a book, right? Is it really considered a book or? This is, well, this was like the second publication I ever made. Uh, so they would not consider it a book because it doesn't have a spine. Yeah, at the right. time, and maybe now they would. But yeah, so this is like a mini comic, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I have it here. I have it. Uh, let's see. There's the squirrel of it. Yeah, so this is a very early Conundrum Press publication from Howard Jaggart. I've been publishing <laughs> Howard his whole life. Here's other ones. Like this is uh, mini. Howard, the actual comic. This is from Distro Distrobito. Yeah, the Distrobito machine. Yeah, yeah. certainly. This was, this was an early one. Fucking shit. Yeah. So that was the out. These are the out classic titles I try to get Andy to publish, but this is what sells Andy. Fucking shit, that's what sells. Those yes. were the outtakes that were too filthy to go in the book. Yes. And yeah, you still what, published them. It's very funny because because in, in Nothing to See Here, uh, you know, I thought Andy was going to probably censor half the book or cut half the book out because of too filthy. I actually have a, full, a file folder here of just dirty, just dirty cartoons that Andy all like completely. But um, you actually kept plenty of the dirty ones in the book, which I was very uh, happy about. Well, well, part of it is your version of dirty has changed, Howard, yeah. having known you 20 years. So you've actually, you're, what you think is dirty, like, what you thought was dirty 20 years ago was just kind of immature. Funny is now you're mature dirty. That's right. That was filthy. Yeah, you're mature dirty. dirty. So that's why. And he had one basic, he basically said, enough with the child mutilation. That was the thing. Yeah. I feel like that. No, no children being mutilated. That's my for, number one. For the, the parents in this, for the parents in this conversation, just so you know, it was all meant to be like anti-hurting children. So it was like war, like war commentary, like you know, children suffer. So just so you know, I wasn't yes, like, in context, of course. There's yes. two parents. There's two parents on this panel. I don't want to. Uh, three parents. Three parents. Andy, two. Uh, when when I, I feel like talking, the parents have probably imagined child mutilation more. <laughs> Yes. Well, I was going to say Dakota kind of has a little bit of that. I should, you know, but the way he does it is a bit different. So that's what I love Dakota about your stuff also is that because, you know, I love dark art, you know, and uh, but but with a purpose, you know, and your stuff is very, when you talk about, uh, that's why I can't wait to get my hands on the new book, even though I've, I've probably seen, like you said, some of the stories, so I love your stuff. And it's just that it always feels like there's a, a, a deeper societal message going on there. You know, so I, 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 I well, love that, you, you know. And appreciate um, it. it just because it goes beyond uh, and, and also you also that you feel the personal suffering too so it's like we you know we're all islands we suffer we have this darkness within us you know but of course we, we can all relate so I, I love that you kind of do both and uh, and beyond uh, i guess in my Thanks, book too, yeah, my pleasure god i, I, I can't wait to, you know uh that's what's great andy too is that you you publish such a, a wide variety of of things also you know and uh, and you never shy away from uh uh, Catherine and, and, and Ronnie also, your books also have, have a share of heaviness, gravitas to it, you know, so that's great. Andy, you want to say you're talking about other people uh, parenting throughout um, COVID, throughout the process of creating. You yourself, as a publisher, you have to do all this stuff too. Well, how about you? Uh, is, do you find, do you relate to, to what Dakota and Catherine are saying about having to parent uh, while, uh, I mean, you don't have the privilege really of taking four years instead of two years, that kind of thing. No, well, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so Dakota's and Catherine's books resonate with me just on an extra level, just because of the parenting. Uh, I have uh, three boys, two of whom are in high school teenagers. Um, so when I started Conundrum Press, I didn't have any kids. And, um, you know, I, they've grown up with the press and everything. But yeah, it, it's, it, it means I can't have... My art life basically was sacrificed completely for publishing. So I have put what I can of that artistic life into the publishing. So, which is partly why I publish all of you, just because I, I and, and why I publish comics a lot instead of uh, fiction or writing. So at Exposine, of course, we have zines, we have books of short stories, we have novels, we have comics, so it's not just comics. Um, so, but I, I started out publishing all that stuff, um, but I switched to comics. Mostly everything I've been doing is just to try to make my, my hobby, which was publishing, into my job, and then I've been trying to make that streamline it so I have time to do other things, which hasn't really worked. And ironically, uh, the lockdown here in the spring in, in, in Atlantic Canada, we totally locked down, as did a lot of other places. 
but we had, as Veronica knows, we had this bubble that, uh, so life was kind of normal a little bit. So we had two kids were away. So we only had one kid. It was like having being having one child and it was just revolutionary having one child <laughs> and was, who was a teenager and can look after himself. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going for a run. Okay, see you later, be back for dinner, you know? So it was like, wow, I have all this time. Like, I, you know, all this stuff's been canceled. So I was able to do some more sort of creative projects, but it took a, it took a global pandemic for me to have time to do that with kids. So, but the other thing is, um, and obviously Dakota and Catherine's art lives prove this, having kids gives you material for being expressive about life. Like, you're, you know, you, 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 you gain this understanding of humanity that can come out in your art as opposed to never having kids. I mean, obviously you can gain a lot of, about humanity without any kids, but it's just a different, different level, I find that it provides a lot of material. And certainly both Dakota and Catherine could speak to that, I think. Dakota, why don't you tell us all about the material your kids have provided you with so I stop talking. Sure, I mean, so far it's just like funny misunderstandings about how the world works, but you know, there, there's also something kind of uh, inherently profound and beautiful about like, watching a person's consciousness come online and, and trying to provide them with the tools they need to navigate a very complicated and at times dark world and to try to keep that lovely, uh, happy spark that I think most children have to, to keep that going. Um, I think it's sort of, for me anyway, I, I can't speak for the rest of the world, but it's it's given me, it's forced me to have more of an understanding of myself and forced me to be more empathetic about other people and their points of view. And, you know, before I had kids, I was like, oh yeah, I'm a pretty empathetic, caring person. And, you know, when you're really put through the ringer of having kids, I, I think it just does fundamentally change you. How could it not? It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a big thing to go through and big things that happen in your life will affect you and change you and change your point of view, whether it's having children or, or traveling the world or, you know, doing a variety of different jobs, whatever it is, it's, you know, it changes who you are. Yeah, well, I, and I want to point out the last story, uh, the title story in your book is yes. completely amazing uh, because of that. And it's Dakota as a single parent, but it, it also, so it isn't, it isn't sort of like rainbows and, and like aren't kids cute. I mean, they are cute, but there's this horror involved. And, and, it, and it's also the level of intensity that the parent undergoes and, yeah, so there's, yeah, exactly. So if you have some something smashing into you, but you can't do anything about it because you have to be a good parent, it's very hard to navigate. So just dealing with these kinds of issues, um, you know, it, it, it makes it a great, I think that's one of the best short story comics I've ever read. Oh, um, but I'm also, I'm going to put the question to Catherine as well. Did you find being a parent adds to your art life and your creativity and 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 your ultimately your humanity, I guess. Of course, but I, I come. I, I to me, it was it, it grounds me a lot. It grounds me and it gives me a lot of structure because otherwise, I think I I could have the tendency to be a bit too much in my head. But now, you know, I wake up at six. I have like very concrete stuff, and also like uh, her her little world and her her uh, friendships and all the dramas like the, the, that kids live and go through and all of that stuff like it, it keeps it keeps you it keeps me very grounded and it puts things in perspectives all the time so I think that's very useful for me in my uh, in my work and also like you come um, it, it forces it, it forced me and that's also a, a little bit why I did that book. It forced me to um, to grow, uh, um, to move away from this idea of uh, say the, the cliche, the la, the what it means to be an artist, like the, the the figure, the classic figure of the artist, like yeah. alone in the woods and creating all the time. It's such a government that doesn't exist for me. Like it. it 
being an artist is in the middle of everything else and it it, it is possible so so yes it's en tout cas, it has enriched my life in, in so many ways. And that's just a, a little bit, but a little example, but it really helps me to, to stay grounded, you know. Okay, great. Well, yeah, I don't want to make this all about parenting, <laughs> but that's great to know, it's good. So Veronica, let's get back to you here. So um, you, you talked about your book being part of a series, I guess, and you've talked about another book so are you, is this something that you're working on right now in your bubble in Halifax? How, what, it, what is it you're working on right now? Um, yeah, I'm working on it uh, more in the sense that I've been writing about what I wanna do, uh, cause I've been doing some grant applications. But in the process of writing about the idea, it's, it's like shifted quite a bit and uh, it's developed quite a bit. So it's been a useful process for me. Um, it's interesting hearing people talk about, you know, initially when they were starting their books, there was aspects that they, they didn't think they were going to get into. And they're like, I don't really want to write about that. But then later on, it actually becomes like a really central part of what their, what their life is and they can't ignore it. <laughs> so I definitely found that happened with me with Langosh and Pepe, because when I first started drawing, they were actually short stories. They were vignettes. And I wasn't getting and I wasn't getting at all into um, like the reasons w behind why Langosh was like living the way he he was. And then I realized as I was writing it, um, I needed to explain it because otherwise people are just going to be like, what? Why is he? <laughs> why is he doing this? Why is he sleeping in a tunnel? What's going on? Um, and that became a really important part of the whole process for me. And I think that's why it took so long to write this book was because it was really a struggle for me to get over being worried about talking about those things. Uh, and in the upcoming books, I, I kind of want to get more into the backstory of Langosh and his, his life story. So like what happened to him before he went to Europe, uh, what spurred that, that choice to like leave home and, and go to Europe and pretty much live as like a weird vagabond. Uh, and I also want to get into, uh, yeah, what's happening in North America in terms of pol politics and, uh, and nationality and uh, privilege and things that are happening with the police and all of that stuff. I think that that's all very interesting and um, related a lot to what Langosh's backstory is anyway. So yeah, I've been working on that. I've been working on uh, writing what, I, what that, I think that second book could look like. Yeah. Okay, and you said books. Are you planning? Yeah, a bunch? yeah. I want to do. I want to do Langosh does America, and then I want to do Langosh does Canada, and then maybe that would be it. <laughs> but the next and one, you I can think... move on to Peppy, and then yeah, just... yeah, Pe Peppy's so backstory awesome. on the streets. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, I was actually debating that. I wasn't sure what I should do first. If I should do Canada first or or America first, but I think. Uh, as usual, America comes first. Ah, uh, yes, well, <laughs> quite, a, quite a time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know, this, Louis gonna probably pop it. It's two, it's, a, well, 2.30 here, but 1.30 there. So Howard, we're gonna give you some last words. We wanna get you in there. Uh, you, do you have any other hats? How many other hats I do you have? Have we I seen them? I, I feel like I ruined my whole set because I, I thought we were going to have like eight minutes each. I was like, okay. I thought it would be like a solo page. I said, okay, I'll put some music. I'll show some people. <laughs> I'll show things. And I, I was going to like put hats on as we were talking, you know? Like, uh, I see. I, yeah, I'm good. But no, uh, no, it's so nice seeing you all also. And uh, I, 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 I appreciate it. Uh, um, do you have a question you want me just to do? Like, sure. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you, what projects are you working on? I know you're in a band. You're asking about my children. All the time. Yeah, what about no. my children? No, um. Yeah, I do have uh, stuff I'm working on now. Oh, yeah. uh, the book, it's kind of weird and I, I can't feel too bad about it because we're all going through, we all went through the same, we all went through the same thing. Our books came out and then COVID hit oh, and every gosh. event, right? And that affects all the publishers like yourself, all of us. So I'm, I, I can't feel too badly about it. Uh, but um, I look now like the way you're all, like, like everyone's saying, I look at the projects I'm kind of working on now I don't think the next comic, because the next, my next project will be 
long, like will be like full length comics. And okay. uh, at a biographical uh, one, one of the jobs I've had, I have some fiction stories. But I mean, it's going to take at least two years, three years or more. So I guess I'm, all the while I'll continue doing gag cartoons. I already have a huge pile here. Piles, I don't know if you can see whatever, piles and piles of do the gag cartoons. I'll have. When we did this book, uh, uh, Andy, of course, we, I live in Montreal, Andy lives in Nova Scotia. I, we must have gone through about two, three thousand drawings <laughs> to, to bring yeah, that. I stayed with you at Exposine. I <laughs> stayed at your house so that I would have some sort of control over your material. And it isn't just a box of napkin drawings. Yeah. Oh, no, I've evolved. I've evolved. You've evolved. Uh, you matured. It's the matured filthy. Yeah. And he would go through like uh, envelope, like, you know, I draw in envelopes, napkins, placemats. This placemat ones, all, all placemat book. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna work on that. I'm gonna just keep working on that new stuff. And I, but I would like to get a book to you of, uh, you know, like an actual comic story rather than another gag cartoon book. So that's what I'm working awesome. on now and I'm writing it all out. I'm trying to work on podcast stuff. I need money. We all need money. There's no money. Yeah, we like support that. Ed Howard is part of uh, the Wiretap crew, CBC Wiretap. Now they just re redid all those or? Replayed uh, them. On they they re-aired. They re-aired some during the summer, and uh, there was some stuff that aired also on This American Life. And so I kind of feel like, oh, I should, I should, I should do the podcasting, you know, and to try to, uh, to I, I just need to make about like about an extra hundred bucks a month. If I can get a hundred bucks a month, if I could just buy five of these, yeah, absolutely. But um, the thing is, you know, as you know, I'm horrible with technology. Uh, Andy and Louis and everybody uh, helped me. Uh, scan things and send things because I'm, I'm such a, a luddite luddite however you pronounce it and uh, so now i bought myself like a zoom recorder and all these things and i haven't i've had it for like three months i haven't even put the batteries in the fucking thing yet i'm so scared of these things i'm scared of computers i'm scared that's why anyway so anyway but yeah, yeah we're working on new stuff still doing piling the reason why i also keep doing the gag cartoons is this way at least i feel i come down every day i draw a bunch and then i write i write for for the longer for the, for the longer length, uh, for the full length comics, I'm writing and I'm trying to experiment with different drawing styles for how it's going to be, because that'll be a uniform drawing style, unlike the book, which uh, the, the gag cartoon book, which has all different styles in it. So that's it. So the, hopefully in two years, I'll have more a pile of gag cartoons and a whole bunch of comics and kids books. I think oh, we should wow. all have kids books. Everything. You're doing it all. Yeah, I'm going to ask books. Catherine the same question. You're not getting the last word after all. So <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> what are you working on? Because obviously you're, you would be working on books in French and then later they come out in English. So is there something that's coming out in French or? Well, hopefully in uh, 2021, in next year, yeah, I will have a, a, another book. It's a, it's a, it's a collection of uh, short stories, but th there is like um, a common thread, like it's uh, auto fiction. It, it's not how you say it, Veronica, you said that auto fiction is not- uh... Autobiographical. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, so yes, so it, it's part, it's uh, fictional characters and uh, I'm one of the characters as well. And it's, it's, it's hard to talk about it because I'm in the middle of uh, of making it, and I'm I'm not really sure. Like uh, I'm not sure what it's about uh, completely. But it's called uh, I have the title, and it's called um, Symptoms. Okay. So is that that that's French and English. It works together, and and is it the same meaning in both? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I think so. yeah. And now is this something you were doing with this Cinematheque? Is that? Uh, you no, were a writer no, or an artist yeah, in residence? Uh, I did comics for them. Like I did a, this art residency for, that, that lasted for uh, many weeks uh, where I moved my, uh, my studio at the Cinematheque and where I was watching movies and then having discussions with spectators. And then I was making short stories that were inspired by the conversations I was having with uh, Okay with people about uh, the movies. So um, uh, this book that I'm working on uh, takes a, a couple of those stories that I entered in the book, but it's not a book about that, uh, that art residency. That, that sounds kind of similar to your art life book, interviewing people about not their life, I guess, so much as like a piece of art that you would have shared together 
Yeah. Well, I, I, I continued the process of interviews and, uh, and uh, having interviews like influenced my work. Like I, I, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Great. Okay. I don't know what's it's going to happen here whether Louis is going to come and sign us out, but why don't we all talk about our experiences at Exposine? So Dakota, have you ever been to Exposine? Yeah, Exposine was my first like small press mini comic. Really? Kind of first show. ever? Yeah. Came yeah. from Toronto? Uh, no. Oh, uh, he's, all right, Louis is giving us the signal yeah. to wrap it up. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> but tell us about Exposine and then you can have the final word, Dakota. No, uh, my wife is doing a master's at McGill. So we moved to Montreal for a couple of years and I was trying to figure out how you get the comics you draw into people's hands. I ended up talking to Billy Mavreas at Mono. Yes, Theater. Billy. Like, There's this thing called Exposing and you should come do it. And so I did and, and then I kept going and doing that. Billy Mavreas would probably the, be the common link between half the people uh, I've ever published, yes. That's yeah, awesome. he was my first uh, also mentor person for a comic book that I did back in Montreal, like in 2010. Totally. He was my first wife. <laughs> hey, we should, yeah, shout out to Billy Mavreas and Rick Tremels has a new book Woo! coming Friday night. Woo -woo! Woo, can't wait to see it. Andy, thank you so much for everything. Yes. Thank you for I'm, everything. All well, you guys. I'm just writing to, I'm just writing to uh, Louis here. I don't know how to send a chat. So, but otherwise, I'm ready. We're ready to leave the meeting, I guess. So, I'm not sure if we just leave. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Ready? All right. Everyone, close it off. Press books and thanks for Exposine. Thank you, guys. Uh, the stream continues till 6 p.m. and you'll be able to find this back online next week. Yay. We're going to clean up and, and put up the uh, all that happened in, in digestible chunks back on our YouTube channel. So thanks a lot. I'll let you guys know when that happens so you could all link and share. And uh, off we go. Uh, really Bye, good everybody. All... Thanks so much. Bye. I hope we can all be together at Exposing next year. Oh, yeah. Next year. Stay safe. <laughs>